Howdy folks. How you doing? On this wonderful Wednesday. I'll just come off and look. Had my tea ready. First things first. Which one we got was a clear. I can see you guys. All the work with you guys and girls. What has everyone been up to this week then? Great news on the vaccine front. Approval reached in the UK anyhow for the Pfizer one. And we've just uh, come out of lockdown. We're in tier two here. Which is kind of good. Hey, we see through the damn things. Right, so what are we going to cover today? Let's have a look at what we are going to do. That's strange. Okay. My oldest was um, tested last week. Amazing turnaround. Uh, she was told that she'd been in contact with somebody. This was because she's a teacher. And um, she'd been in contact with another teacher that got positive test result. She was immediately, uh, you know, told to isolate and get a test. It was on Wednesday last week. And then... Um, She got the test, but she had the result on Thursday as a key worker. So, pretty amazing. And she it was negative. She's good. And then I found out my youngest has just had her first test today because she's off at uni. And she's got another test on Saturday because she comes back on Sunday. Again, negative so far, which is cruel. Test, test, test. And vaccine soon. Hopes, hopefully. Hope everyone else is healthy. It's good. Uh, if anyone can hear the audio, let me know if I'm okay on the audio front. Um, just waiting for people to arrive. There's a few. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what we're going to cover news-wise, etc. And uh, the main events, main things I want to talk about. Hope everyone is well. Right, so let's kick off then. Ding! Right, so what am I going to talk about today? Um, community and news. Not a massive uh, community and news section this week that's good because that leaves us more time for the in-depth stuff which i'm looking forward to talking about i'm going through with you guys i must not lean on this desk it makes the um i've got one of these arm mounted uh it's quite a large monitor but it's the webcam's on top of it and if i move it too much can you see it's like earthquakesville i'm gonna try and avoid doing that but um, so let's go through the community stuff. Um, uh, I met up with Ken uh, very briefly uh, back in the last week. We had a, we had a coffee 
at a suitable distance, social distance. And um, we agreed to start looking at some things. And then we had a really long call this week going through some ideas and stuff. So, I mean, the plan is that we're going to work on a project together uh, in the new year, which is brilliant, really cool. Um, I can't give you any real details on that yet. Um, other than to say there will be an FPGA part to it, most definitely. It's probably aimed at educational area, maybe with a retro, retro angle as well. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it'd be good to work with Ken again on uh, on a project um, and we will keep you in the loop with that I will get Ken on one of these streams one day we should be good but anyhow so something to look forward to for in uh, 2021 so that's the first item on the news and community list uh, and now I've said that and had that meeting with him he can't back out he's already agreed <laughs> I'm going to kill me now. Right, so second thing uh, on the forum, Wells was talking about register manipulation uh, using the STM32 on his black eyes. Um, we hadn't talked about that in a while, but there is, um, you've got to remember with black eyes, you've got two parts, right? you've got the FPGA part and then you've got the STM32 part. So you can write the, your you know, if you're making a project, you can combine, you know, obviously uh, your C code and uh, your FPGA Verilog, etc., and have the two items talking. Uh, normally, the way that we historically recommended you do that, the easiest way to do that was use the Arduino support um, that was uh, initially cooked up by Richard Miller, I think. Uh, and you can still download that and use it, I believe. On the F7, it's slightly different. I'm not sure if there's anything easily downloadable on that. But certainly on the ice, Black Ice 2, um, which is what Wells was talking about, just the board that he's got, uh, he was just using the Arduino stuff. Um, that also includes a small library to enable you to have a, a quad SPI conversation with the FPGA, which is useful. Uh, in his case, he's also using the DAC and the ADCs, which are very good, actually, uh, in the um, STM. Um, I'll give you a link for that as well. Um, that is something we will be covering again at some point soon. Um, let me just get the link for this. Hold on. Here's the thread. If you want to take a look and join that conversation, uh, there are other threads that cover this area as well, by the way. Uh, but that's going to become more relevant um, when we start talking about. Uh, the integration we want we want to make that easier one of the things that alloy was doing was actually making that more accessible um, so moving forward we want to make that more accessible and we could probably do that um, uh, when I talk about black eyes 5 you'll see the the things that we can do there as well that are interesting so um, the other thread that's had a little bit of attention this week is uh, this one, where we're talking about the uh, tiles and stacks. It's very relevant to lead us into our next part as well in a second. Let me just give you the link for that. Um, so the tiles and stacks. Um, I did mention this briefly. Uh, oh, I did mention this briefly last week, I, I, and I've talked about it before as well. The uh, 
basic idea is um, you need a robust way of interconnecting um, cards, expansion peripherals and cards, etc. Um, clearly we support things like PMODs and mixed mods, but mechanically they're not very stable. There's a lot of movement in that. It would be no good for things like robotics or automation or in heavy environments. Um, so what the tiles and stacks do is they enable you to, you know, the tiles get added on to the daughter board and they actually get screwed down so they're very fixed. Uh, and you can do them on top and below in, in some cases. You actually end up with this kind of stack, which is why we use the term tiles or stack. And that gives us much more robust connectivity, particularly when you're building things, uh, particularly for things like robotics and automation and stuff like that, where mechanical um, assembly it needs to be more robust. But it just makes more sense. It's just um, if you've ever worked with uh, when you're building projects, you quite often end up with either a you know, a bunch of wires or loose connected components and something disconnects and it's it's a nightmare and you can be chasing around in circles for ages, chasing down bugs in the connectivity. Um, whereas this is a very robust way of putting things together. Uh, and that's why we were talking about, you know, actually experimenting with the stack and tile um, around Black Ice uh, 5. So uh, I pasted the thread there where we talked a little bit about that. Originally we were talking about a Black Ice 5 based on a Ice 40. If you saw the stream last week, uh, you would have seen a kind of um, CAD design for that. Um, and this, what, what you're going to see moving forward is a slight divergence from that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that this week. So let's just move straight into that. So that's the news pieces. I know there's not a lot there. Um, is there any other news pieces that people would like to share? Say now, or Heather, hold your peace, as they say. Um, so, on the Black Ice 5 front, um, I played around with the different designs based around the ice ice 40 up 5k etc um, and I just couldn't get things to pan out the way that I wanted there was some limitations in terms of um, the connectivity among other things so uh, on that thread you'll notice uh, Laurie pointing out yeah keep things simple focus on what it is testing for. Um, so what I've done is I've returned to an older idea effectively that um, I've been planning on doing a while. So I thought I'd wrap that in. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about and show you I think is the way forward unless someone can come up with a very good reason why I don't want to go down this route. Um, because it actually solves a number of issues that I already have as well as giving us the opportunity um, to explore the tile and stack space. So let me get the CAD open because that's probably the best place to start. Uh, once that's running up. So I need at least two two tiles to make this worthwhile so it needs to support minimum of two tiles possibly more All right let me just rearrange my windows here because i've got hundreds of the damn things my cad's in a right mess so let's just get some of these out of the way <laughs> Arrange my screen a bit so that you can see what I'm doing. And let's switch over to CAD. Hold on. Hmm. 
Don't need that, don't need that. Uh, do need that. I don't want to pick the wrong window again. Not uncommon. Uh, schematic. Uh, do 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 do. Okay. So, what you see here is what I'm planning on putting together. Um, I've got to order the boards first this week, any luck. This is what I'm officially calling Black Ice 5. Did you notice my screen's a bit wonky? Go on, pussy cat. Try about that. So, let me talk about where we are. You see my cursor, right? So, what is this? What is this new Black Eyes Five? Um, it's got bigger, says Laurie. <laughs> yes, it's a bit bigger. Um, the dimensions currently, uh, it is bigger. They are currently uh, 125 mil by 75 mil. Um, in the center is one of these. Ice core, you know, you probably got one if you got a Black Ice MX sitting on the Black Ice MX carrier. So what we're looking at here is a is a carrier for the ice core, a new carrier for the ice core that I'm calling, for want of a better term, my storm Black Ice. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to do the tile and stack development using the ice core. Okay. Now, the reason for doing that is we get a lot more IOs and we get um, some useful bits and pieces that I need to test as well as part of this. Uh, let me just take you round the board. So on the left hand side here is tile number one, if you like. Uh, that's the connector facing downwards. It's an SMD, sorry, facing upwards. It's an SMD connector to so the tile literally sits on top on the left hand side here and then on the right hand side you've got exactly the same thing so if you were to look at that board you've got two tiles and then the uh, carrier underneath and then in the middle you have the ice core board okay so um, the ice core board itself at the back you have a mix mod connector. Now, the reason I've done that is so that you've got some backwards compatibility. Uh, particularly if you've already got some mix mod peripherals that you may want to use in combination with the tile. So this kind of gives us maximum flexibility in terms of combinations at this point, because it's transitional. Um, and the idea is that I will be shipping these instead of the MX carriers moving forward. OK, um, now obviously you don't have to buy the ice core again. If you've already got a black ice MX, you've already got an ice core. So all you need is a carrier. Um, so that will be available separately. OK, just so that you understand that. And also note that this is not yet tested. So it's probably going to be a few weeks before these are available. It's unlikely that I'm going to have any in time for Christmas, but you never know. But I'd say it's unlikely, more like New Year. <clears throat> now, the reason I've done this is because I, to me, as well as giving me the features that I need for testing, 
it's the best way to get something out there that everybody can use. Um, the problem with the alloy stuff, for example, is not everyone's got that, and I have to build a whole bunch of them in order to get them out. Um, because there are lots of ice cores out there, um, it's a lot easier for me to get this out. So that's the first thing. So let's just go into a bit more detail here. So on the left hand side here, this is potential. I'm thinking of putting a normal size HDMI connector, which I'm trying to source at the moment. Um, so that we've get our HDMI back that we lost with the mini issue. Um, so I'm hoping that will work, that will need testing. That's less important. That's just like a bonus, bonus thing. Um, and then on the right hand side here, we've got an SD card front facing. The current SD card is rear facing on the ice core, which is a bit of a pain. But there's another reason for having it here. And I'll, some of that is to do with uh, the extra support that's coming in. So the key thing to notice in the center here is this um, basically uh, W Rover. ESP32 Rover, which is the easiest way of getting the kind of alloy software support in um, on a module. And I have played with this for a few days and I've gone through different possibilities. I did think about laying down the chips separately with the antenna, etc. But in the end, this is the quickest way to get there and it's not much more expensive. Despite the fact I've already got the bits to do it. Um, um, you know discreetly but i can use those for something else that's not 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 a big issue um how does this all hook together oh, right okay let me see if i can share i just had an obs I just had an OBS disconnect, by the way, guys. You didn't miss anything. Let me see if I can share a very lazy drawing. Just to explain that tile concept briefly, um, this is a drawing I did um, last week actually. So here's the tile here and here's the main board. I, it's a carrier in this case. And that's the way it, it sits, just as a quick um, explanation. But the uh, diagram I wanna talk about today is this one, um, which is a bit scrappy. Apologies for that. Ooh, it's funny the way that squished that in like that. Why that is. Okay. Um, There we go. So if we look at the ice five bit, I know this isn't a particularly um, clever drawing. I don't know why it's kind of squashed up like that. Let me just try and change the aspect ratio a bit. Shift, yes, shift. Mm. 
Uh, oh, this is a bit annoying. Here we go. Still a bit skewed. Anyhow, so the point is here. Uh, so we have the ICE 40 HX on the board. Internally, that's got SD RAM connected to it. Um, it's got a digital video type connection, which we're using to connect a digital video connector. Uh, we've got a uh, MX connector. And we've got two tiles on the side here. And then the arrangement that we've got here in terms of the connectivity, uh, we've got the STM32, which is on the ice core board. That has two, well, several connections to the ice 40 HX as a DSPI connection, which is good for exchanging data. Um, data in this case being, for example, ADC or DAC data uh, or memory type transfers because it's quite efficient. Uh, there's also a UART connection between the two. There's obviously the ADC inside the STM32 and it has its own USB, which we use to upload the files. Um, so how does that fit in when we add the ESP32 into the equation on the carrier board? Well, there is a um, SPI connection that the ESP32 can share with the STM32, number one. Uh, and then there is potentially a quad SPI connection into the ICE40, um, which shares the same pins that the internal SD card on the ICE core uses. Um, because we've got our own SD card on the ESP, uh, we don't need to use the other one, so we can use a quad SPI. But that's, we can turn that on and off where we want to use that, so it could still be used for the onboard SD card if we still needed to use it. But normally we'd sacrifice that SD card. It's easier to use the SD card on the ESP. 32 simply because the libraries and things are there for the file systems etc rather than having the FPGA having to waste gates for that kind of stuff um, and optionally the ESP may have a USB connection so that's kind of why it's wired also there's a UART link between the ESP32 and the STM32 uh, again that usage may vary depending on um, on the choices we make about which module we install on the carrier because there are choices now the key thing here is we can use python to do the orchestration just like we are doing in alloy rather than having to write low level c etc in the stm32 not only that but what we'll be able to do is join up the Python in the ESP32 with the NMIG and stuff to generate um, the necessarily uh, necessary register um, address space, etc. Um, we can automate the uh, the um, the layouts, the memory layouts, and the communication primitives let, let, let's for the moment let's just call those um, uh, asynchronous events uh, and I'll get into a bit more detail with how I see that working as well um, let's just see if we can switch back to the um, CAD so going back to the CAD then, um, the ESP32 here is actually um, connecting up on this side of the ICE40, which is where most of the STM32 connections are. Um, so for example, the uh, SPI type connections in and out of both the FPGA and the STM32 and the UART. Um, and we've also got the STE card connections in there as well. The SD card on this board here is connected to uh, the ESP32 module here. Um, and that really takes over the file storage part of the equation. So you don't need to use the built-in um, SD card. If you remember, if you look very closely at the ICE 
If you look at the back of the eyes, can you see here you've got this um, SD card? It clicks in, clicks out on the bottom. So that becomes effectively redundant, and we use the connectivity that that has to do our QSBI connection into the uh, ICE 40 HX. Um, the other good thing about this is we have the SD RAM mapped in there as well. Um, and one of the things that I would like to play on a bit further along, as well as doing the stack stuff, is work out how to memory map both internal memory for the HX uh, ICE 40, you know, the block memory, and uh, ways of reading and writing to that SD RAM as a kind of extended piece of shared heap effectively between excuse me between the FPGA and the um, and the ESP32 um, so the ESP32 is really orchestrating the events you're effectively writing your application in Python on the ESP32 um, that doesn't leave the STM32 on board out of the equation because that's still handling all the analog stuff and it's really good for that. It has really good ADCs on it. It's got several very fast ADCs on it um, and it has some DACs as well. So it can handle all that analog stuff plus it has the... Um, uh, the uh, floating point unit as well which the extensor doesn't have so it can pre-process the analog as well and it has a dsp connect connection dual you know uh dual uh spi connection into the fpga as well so the fpga can actually it, it can effectively switch into a slave mode so it's queried directly uh by the fpga or queried over a bus that exists inside the FPGA so all the pieces connect together plus it still has its programming capability as well so it can write to the flash and it can be programmed dynamically and it gives you all the support that you already had it's built into the things like the nightly version of iStudio and the tools etc that we use plus the MX version of uh, the Enmigen board drivers and I will develop those a bit further as well to include the ESP stuff so that's that. Um, probably the critical bit in this design. Oh, Laurie says lots to play with here. Hmm. So you like it then, Laurie? Good. So the second part of the discussion that's related to this CAD. So, I mean, these boards, I'm hopefully going to get finished this week and ordered. They're actually quite simple. Um, to whatever happens, we'll have a few in several weeks' time. It depends on postage and stuff. It's impossible to predict at the moment. Things are a bit rubbish on that front. But... Um, we will certainly have a few, certainly within the early first weeks of the new year, maybe before, maybe in December at some point. So we can actually start testing this along with hopefully, you know, uh, one or two different uh, tiles that can be put on them to test that part. Of it. Uh, it looks good to port retro stuff from the ULX freeboard. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, what we don't have as much of is it the internal SRAM, obviously. Uh, so it may be a bit more tricky using the SD RAM, but yeah. Um, yeah, with HDMI, ESP32, and SD RAM. Sure. I, I concur entirely, Laurie. Uh, and it's a good enhancement if you've already invested into the ICE core. Uh, family and black edge family then this is a great add-on so um, here's the biggie 
here's the bit I'm struggling with. Uh, and this is really just a decision thing. Um, I've kind of got an inkling which way I'm going. It's definitely a 50-50 thing, one way or t'other. So if we focus on this piece here, this, this format is what's called a uh, rover, it's built with a W. Uh, it's a standard ESP32 module, C mark module. Very similar to what we're using in Alloy. Here's the story. There's two ways we can go with this. Sorry, I'm leaning on the desk and shaking the camera. Two ways we can go with this. We can either go with the S2, as I'm using in Alloy, which means using Circuit Python. The other way we can go is we can go with the ESP32, not the S2. And there's a couple of different ESP32s. Uh, there are different variants that we can go for with different amounts of uh, spy RAM and ROM. <clears throat> and I'll probably offer an option. But there are key differences between those two things. So one is MicroPython versus circuit python we could go either way here okay what are the big differences and now internally in the software there are some quite remarkable differences um there's a lot of work that's been done on circuit python on top of MicroPython. there could be slightly better memory management among other things the um web communication libraries have been undergoing quite a bit of work on circuit python as well i don't know how much each of that gets merged back into MicroPython, but i do know also that MicroPython has new stuff that isn't supported in circuit python so forgetting those small differences in optimization etc there are two very big differentiating features right uh, yeah laurie griffith says <laughs> could we not support both uh i don't think it's easy to support both right so for example the esp32 s2 only has circuit python support there is no micro python official support Okay, so you can't just run MicroPython on it. I know CircuitPython uses MicroPython, but what it does is it uses an older version and then it uses a whole bunch of stuff that's been developed for CircuitPython folks. Um, likewise, the ESP32 stuff, the non S2 stuff, forget the new C3 things, I'm not even going there, but the existing ESP32 family is well supported in MicroPython, but is not supported in CircuitPython because CircuitPython has a minimum requirement, which is the big feature differentiator between these two things. The big bonus, if you like, in CircuitPython's favor, which is this, it needs a built-in USB in order to support the way that it is programmed. Because in CircuitPython, they basically enable the flash to be partitioned in a way that means that when you plug it in, it comes up as a drive. It's basically a USB storage device, as well as a low speed uh, virtual uh, serial port. So it's not easy to support both because they don't support both, if you see what I mean. It's a one way or a at the moment. Later on, that may change, by the way. Um, although CircuitPython is unlikely to support the existing S32 purely because there is no built-in um, USB part. There is no OTG USB in the ESP32s. It only exists in the S2 and the new C3.
Okay, so the advantage that CircuitPython has is it has that nice convenient mounts as a disk, you can edit the file directly, save it, etc., and it's automated. That is in itself a double edged sword. It's great for new users just getting into using MicroPython on embedded. It's not so great for us where we're having to do something a bit more complicated. Not only that, I've had all sorts of weird issues with it where I'm thinking, has it updated? When I've changed stuff, has it reloaded the binary? Is the binary loaded into the FPGA, etc.? There are issues with it. It is none perfect at this point. And that's partly because also I'm running a kind of semi beta version as well, because my mine forks slightly from the official circuit Python. Um, but that's one of its big selling features. It also has quite a few developers behind it now. And it's picking up quite a bit of um, momentum. Laurie saying, um, currently I would prefer MicroPython, uh, as I can use all of the software from the ULX Free S. Okay, right. So the other option is we don't go with CircuitPython. Uh, that also means we don't have to put another USB connector on. Saves us a component or two. In fact, it saves us one, two, three, four, about four components, I think, at least. So if we go with MicroPython rather than CircuitPython, are there an advantage to MicroPython over CircuitPython? Well, yes, there is. Glad you asked. Uh, Laurie knows about this. So the key advantage, certainly my own personal opinion, is that MicroPython, uh, the latest version 1.13, I think it is, which was brought out about a month or two ago, has added support for what they call micro async. Uh, if you're from the Python world, async IO is um, quite a cool way of handling events. Um, historically, you had these awful kind of yieldy patterns in Python, uh, num blocking type patterns, and it was all very cumbersome. Anyhow, it, it, over the years it developed, eventually, it became async IO. Now, um, the latest iteration of MicroPython supports uh, async IO, or what they call micro or U async IO, which is an implementation of async IO on MicroPython that uses um, low level C routines and task switches. Basically, async IO uh, certainly. Uh, as far as MicroPython is concerned, is really like a little task manager. It's, a, it's basically coroutines. So one thing you don't get with CircuitPython is any kind of notion of tasks. You've got one algorithm, one routine, you know, one main. Well, with uh, with async IO, uh, which is implemented using coroutines, you have a much better structure. And a much better way of organizing your Python handling, um, not just from an orchestration point of view, but from a point of view of um, breaking off and constructing uh, in a sensible fashion, given that you're not really using an operating system. It's better than threads, actually, in, in many ways, because you can organize it much better. So because you've got that, you can use that to handle things like interrupts. You can use it to handle events. So how I would structure this is if I was using, I mean, I want to use async IO. I wanted to use it for a while, but I was gonna kind of hang on and wait for CircuitPython because they will need to do something at some point in the future task wise because they don't support multiple tasks the logical way for them to go at some point is async io but they're a long way from that they literally have just done uh, a big release so 
um, we're not going to see it for some time. <coughs> Thus, I am leaning towards the micro Python side. Because I want async IO. Here's some of the things I think we could do with that. So if we've got the connectivity between the ESP32 is it has UART2, the STM32, right? It has SPI from, I have to get the direction right here because it is complicated, from the FPGA. And it's the same SPI that the STM32 is on that it uses to program the FPGA. The difference between this and Alloy is we are not programming the FPGA over SPI from the ESP32. We could program it if we liked over the UART link to the STM32. And then the STM32 in turn programs that in real time. But we're not using the SPI to actually program it. We can't do that because we don't have the uh, necessary reset signal on the ICE 40 because I didn't expose that purposely because I wanted the STM32 to always be in charge here. Um, in fact, I'm going to keep that so it can manage it. And I'm also going to make it so that the STM32 can actually be in charge of the ESP32 because something has to be in charge and the reason I can do that is that means I can reset ESP32 also I will be able to reprogram the ESP32 um, using the serial USB it's not actually that difficult because I've already got a UART link to the ESP32 I've also got important lines like the boot and reset line which I can connect to pins on the ESP32 as well. Uh, in fact, that's done, let's move mouse gone through jumpers up here. Okay. So when the STM32 isn't in programming mode, i.e. it's programmed the FPGA, the FPGA is running or the synthesized or implemented the synthesized uh, design, the SPI then goes into a slave mode. So the, <clears throat> the FPGA can then talk to the ESP32 as an SPI slave, number one. That same uh, SPI is used to program any of the tiles as well, which also share that, ES, that SPI plus their individual pin selects. The ESP32 is also connected to the ICE40 via a quad SPI link using the same pins that the SD card uses. So if you, assuming you're not using the SD card on the internal ICE, ICE core, that quad SPI link is available between the ESP32 and the ICE40. What's that used for? That's used in the same way that we use it on Alloy. Remember, we're doing that spy development in MMIGEN, where that same development will operate here. That is the conversations, the transactions, the data transactions that occur here start from the orchestration, from the Python side, from the ESP32. The ESP32 is the master of that quad SPI bus. Okay, so there's two things coming to ESP32 from the FPGA. One is a slave SPI, which is used for events, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Could also be used for configuration. And the other one is a master relationship with the ICE40. I shouldn't be saying master. Let's say host and peripheral. Not that the FPGA is really a peripheral in this case, but let's say that. So in this case, the SP32 is the host on the quad SPI bus to the FPGA and it is a peripheral on the SPI bus from the FPGA. Why have we got two? Okay, this is where async IO comes in. So if you look at the stuff that we've been doing <clears throat> on M, sorry, I could have a drink, got dry throat. 
if you look at the stuff we've been doing in MMIGEN, where we're adding SPI to be at a control and program registers in the FPGA, <clears throat> in that relationship, the MMIGEN side is the slave and the master, the host side, sorry, I keep saying master, host side, in this case ESP32 or S2 in Alloy is in control. It, it's issuing the information and requesting information back. And because it can be either SPI or quad SPI, we can move data quite quickly. Okay. The other thing is information comes back from the FPGA. Now, remember the way that this design, the alloy idea works. You have Python doing the orchestration. The one thing that this cannot do, because it's Python, uh, is real time. No way you can do real time on this. So it's really just concerned with the app functionality. It may do some display stuff. It may do the communication stuff, like the web communication stuff, because it does the networking over Wi-Fi, etc. It may even do Bluetooth. Um, then it's good at those things, and it has quite a bit of memory to be able to do that. It's no good at real-time stuff. That's what the FPGA does. Remember that split that I spoke about over the last several streams, where we have the FPGA doing the real-time stuff, because that's what it's really good at. Now, sometimes we require information to go from the orchestration, the Python, to the FPGA. Other times, the information must come back. Okay, so for example, if there was a motion control system, we'd be sending out stepping information from the orchestration. The orchestration works out the paths of the movement, you know, in our kind of motion system. But what it will need to get back is events. So for example, if there's an event like it's reached home, maybe we've told it to home, then we need an event coming back. Now, that is an asynchronous event. We don't know what's going on. Now, we could just poll, but that's a really bad pattern in Embedded. Um, so what we do is we have the FPGA contact us. We're basically saying, you let me know when this happens. You're in charge. You're doing the real-time stuff. Let me know when you need me to do something or react to something. So that pattern that the SPI, the slave part of it from the ESP point of view, it's a slave to the FPA. FPA says, we're home. I've just detected, you know, the micro switch. Sends an SPI message, or it sends an interrupt and an SPI message. That generates an internal event in the task controller inside the async IO. The correct coroutine is launched not launch is 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 selected effectively so that way you've got the complete circle so that's really what i'm thinking and that's why i want to use async io and the quickest way of doing that is via micro python because we're going to have to wait a long time for circuit python to get there so that's why i am leaning towards using MicroPython on this, on Black Ice 5, rather than Circuit Python. It doesn't mean we won't ever be able to run Circuit Python. It's entirely possible that that may happen. But it's not going to happen in the short term, would be my guess. Okay, that's what I'm thinking. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, I think the SP32 has better SD card support as well. And it has MMC card support, whereas the S2 only has ST card support. Whether that's supported in the MicroPython or not is another question. I don't know the answer to that. Laurie says, sounds good to me. 
Which bit sounds good? What go in the Python root, micro Python root rather than circuit Python root for ice five? Sorry, black ice five. You get it right. Is that a what are your thinkings? Hmm? Yes, micro Python. Okay, then. Right. On that basis, I think. I'm going to go ahead unless somebody else tells me they want to do it differently or can think of a very good reason to do it differently. Um, in terms of the uh, Rover module, there are different different uh, options available. You can get different flash and spy RAM sizes. I'm still trying to clarify what is and is not supported. I think uh, I think the four um, megabyte spy RAM flash is supported on micro. I'm not sure that the eight megabyte one is like it is on um, circuit Python. So we may have a limited choice, but I may be able to do that as an option uh, just in the same way if you look uh, at the black ice MX currently on Tindy you can select which bits that you want with it well on there I might have a list of Wi-Fi options from a kind of modest 2 meg through to an 8 meg potentially um, I think that covers the basis right you got any questions guys sorry I've been chatting away here are there any questions about this direction with the black ice from either the uh, tile stack standpoint or you know the micro Python versus circuit Python How are we doing for time as well? I'll wait for you guys to respond. Um, hmm. I've been going an hour already. Okay. Time flies when you're having fun. Laurie says this gives a huge number of options. <sighs> Definitely worth waiting for then, Laurie. I do flip and go between different things until I think I've found the best option. Sometimes you have to kind of get into designing these things before you can see the way forward. It's strange like that. Or maybe that's just the way that my mind works. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Let me not assume that everybody is exactly like that. They may have more organized manners of work than mine. <laughs> I have a very experimental attitude to design in many ways. I am no Jonathan Ives, I could assure you. So what are the options then that that gives you, Laurie? The huge number of options, or are they just so humongous you can't list them? <laughs> it's always good when you please, Laurie. He's a, bit, he's a good critic. It's good for retro. That's because it's got the HDMI, right? That's one way, one, one advantage. And the tiles, yeah, yeah, tiles are very good. Quite robust as well. What do you think of the layout, the way it's arranged? I know it takes up more room. There were more compact ways of doing it, but this just struck me as practical. Uh, 
having the two tiles, one on each side, and then the mix mod at the back to fall back on if you need to use mix mods. <clears throat> you like the layout? That's good. I'm happy. The SP32 helps for Norrie's retro stuff. Yeah, because you're already using that, presumably, uh, on the ULX3S because they use the ESP32 and MicroPython. They don't use Circuit Python, do they? I don't know which module they use, but um, wait. Is it a Rover module or is it, um, what's the other one? The Vroom? Do they call it the Vroom? V R O O M? Can't remember. So basically, what you're saying there is you can quite easily port your MicroPython stuff. Okay, what about? I mean, the other thing we got, I did forget that there is another big bonus. Right, well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, they are experimenting with those ESP32 options on new versions of the ULX3S. Okay, yeah. There's lots more now than there were before. Um, what was I going to say? Yes, yeah, so we are losing that uh, USB storage device stuff. Does that have any negative implement, implement, Im, implications for you, Laurie, and others? How much RAM does the uh, ESP32 have? It is it just what it's got internally, or does it have the PS RAM as well? Just internal. Oh yeah, that's crap. Jesus, the bugger all. Uh, it's like 500 max, 500k. And you use up Python very quickly. Uh, we'd have a minimum of two megabytes, but up to potentially eight. But I'm not sure that MicroPython supports eight. I think it only supports four at the moment. Um, but that will be fixed, I'm sure. Losing what? Sorry, losing the USB file system support. Sorry. USB storage support that you get with the S2 and Circuit Python. That's what I was talking about, Laurie. Does that have any negative implement? Any negative uh, implications for the stuff you're working on? Doesn't bother me, he says. Okay, good. <laughs> So it's a win-win with a third win. Yes, because the other advantage that I forgot, totally forgot, that I should mention is on these you get Bluetooth as well as Wi-Fi. Yeah, that could be handy. Not sure what for, but lots of people keep talking to me about Bluetooth. I guess if you want to connect to a phone or something, that might be useful. Or who was it who said it the other day? Maybe it was in my conversation with Ken. Bluetooth keyboard is also quite useful. And Bluetooth controllers for games. They're also quite popular. I, yeah, Ken was talking about the Bluetooth keyboard. Um... But yeah, I've seen other people refer to these kind of Bluetooth uh, games controllers that are really quite smart. Have you used any of those, Laurie, the Bluetooth controllers? Doing circuit Python in future when more mature on a USB 32 would be good. Yeah. Have you used any of the Bluetooth uh, stuff, Laurie? 
like game controllers, keyboards, etc. Is that a good feature to have? Because it may be another benefit of going this route, because you don't get the Bluetooth with the S2, therefore you don't get it with Circuit Python. Not on the ESP anyhow, not ESP 32s. Lois is useful, but I have not used it much. Um, yeah, some people really like those Bluetooth game controllers. So it's another possibility, or another bonus if we go this route. Um, so yeah, the, if you look at the CAD, it's fairly simple. Uh, I should be able to get this out pretty soon. Um, I think I've now got the solution that I'm happy with to go ahead with, get the prototypes done, then we can start testing it, start working out um, how these tiles and things work. I've got a tile design that I'm near completion on. Uh, is there anything that you want to see on a tile uh, whilst I remember? Please let me know. Uh, initially, the tiles I'm thinking of is Possibly a prototype tile, obviously. Simple to do a prototype tile. A um, bit like the proto or patch boards that we did for the mix mods. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to complete the motion control tile. That will give me a four axis motion control tile, which I really want to test. And I need that to. Um, continue the streaming series, the Mijin parts of that for the motion controller moving forward. Um, might be worth looking at an educational tile as well, possibly. Um, games console pair of tiles would be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you thinking the same tile but doubled up? One thing that you have to be aware of, looking if you look at the layout here, one is the mirror image of the other. It's flipped. It's rotated, 180 degrees. Yeah. So you'd have to take that into consideration if you wanted one tile that works on both sides. I don't know how you do that. Depends what you want to put on each tile, really. Oh, two different tiles. So what would you put on the tiles? What are you thinking of doing like VGA on one of them or something or USB on the other? I don't know. With buttons, direction pads and an LCD connector. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. How would the LCD work? Are you thinking a big LCD? covering a large portion of the carrier or a tiny LCD. Just thinking how that would fit on and hence where the buttons would be. Big. Yeah, have to find some interesting way of fitting that. Yeah, it might be a bit thick. Um, Depends what's on the tiles. I've often thought of building the tiles with the components on the inside rather than the outside, i.e. the underside rather than the top. A couple of advantages. One is all of the surface mount components are on the same side, which makes stuff easier for building. The other is it actually makes it slightly narrower you've got nothing sticking up at top then you end up with a flat surface i.e the back of the board 
if there's no through holes on there then it's a flat surface that you can do what you like with. But uh, in terms of distance between the two, it is like that, isn't it? Which is Hold on, hold on. I think that's about 10 centimeters. Just the connectors, pin to pin, maybe 11 millimeters, not centimeters. About one centimeter is the gap between the boards. There isn't a MIPI connector on this because it's using the HX. HX doesn't support MIPI. It's not fast enough. We're using the ice core, remember. You won't get MIPI until you get to uh, the amalgam with ECP5 on it. Ouch. These pogo pins are extraordinarily sharp. So it's one centimeter distance. Is that um, doable? Do you think? It's not too thick, is it? <sighs> but I mean, these tiles will stand up higher than the ice core. The ice core will be slightly lower. That won't be level with the others. But then this does have components on it. So by the time you've added the height, the components on are similar, I guess. The HDMI, sorry, not the HDMI, the mini DV connector. Hold on, what is the, um... <laughs> can I measure that actually now? Yeah, basically the top of the mini DV connector is going to be level with the top of the board, more or less, top of the tile, assuming the tile is flat and the components are on its underside. The rest of the components are on the ice core are slightly lower, although the buttons are a bit higher. So it should work quite nicely. Right, any other questions on this? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the M Migen stuff before we run out of time. How are we doing? Yeah, we've still got a bit of time left, so we've still got time for a few more questions or anything that you want to cover. Now oh, I'm pretty much out of tea. Am I missing anything in the design that you can think of? JP1 is for configuration. So, for example, <clears throat> I can use it to connect the boot and reset signals from the ESP32 into the STM32. But also on that JP1, uh, I've got the um, SWIO pins, the debug pins for the STM32, which would be useful for development purposes when I'm bringing it up. Uh, 
Uh, I think there's a couple of extra spare pins on there as well. I think I've got, um, there's two, oh, let me think. The, I, the two pins from the uh, ice core that come down a black edge connector, which can either be I squared C or um, uh, CAN, RX and TX. If you want to connect like a CAN transceiver, I figured those two might be useful. So they're on that connector as well, on the jumper connector. I don't know why these get so dirty in my glasses. I have to get some glass cleaner on these. Will HDMI work okay over black edge connectors? It's only moving a relatively short distance. I think so. It will be interesting to find out, Laurie, is the answer. And it's just, it's not, <clears throat> it's not just because it's moving over the connector. It's because there are, um, spurs, via capacitors to the mini connector. So it's whether we get any significant reflection on those. Those are very short. The capacitors are actually mounted, you know, the ones for the mini uh, DVI connector were purposely mounted almost literally over the connector pins on the ice core. So the distance that those spurs travel is minute. So we stand a good chance of having a semi-decent signal, but until we test it, I really don't know. Lori. That's what I'm saying is we'll put the connector on there. I can't guarantee how it's going to operate. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get a decent signal. Remember, it is digital as well. It's not analog. So, you know, there is some built in tolerance. As long as we don't get any serious reflections. I think the connector will house them. The speed that that's moving at isn't um, too much for those connectors. And it's going a very short distance, remember. But we will see on that one, Laurie. It's not uh, until we actually try it. It's difficult to know for sure. It's a bonus if it works, is the way I see it. Right. Uh, anything else? Otherwise, I'll move on to the Enmigen stuff. I've just got to set up a couple of bits here. Remember where we left off. I know what do I need. I need need a power shell. Um, an audio jack on the power board would be good. Well, I did actually have one at one point. There are issues with it though. If you look over here, here are the things that have <laughs> been on that board and taken off, including an audio jack. Ta -da. Uh, that was originally, before I took it off, connected to the STM32 ADC slash DAC pins. But uh, 
I'm slightly limited on those pins because two of them are being used for a comms port to the USB 32, which I want to keep. And the others as well, so there's four each for the tiles, which is eight, plus two for the comms port, that's ten. At least five, and I need five for the uh, mix mod. So <clears throat> when I was having those on the audio jack, I was also having it on the mix mod. And I'm just trying to avoid doubling up because, well, it confuses people really. Yeah, and that's the other thing, it's not connected to the FPGA. Well, the thinking there was there's some good DAC stuff inside the um, STM32. Um, and the STM32 can be talked to over SPI as a slave or over the SPI. <sighs> it's got filters as well, potentially. What do they call them? Um, uh, discrimination filters, digital discrimination filters for when you're doing Sigma Delta stuff. But yeah, they, if you want to connect it directly to the uh, FPGA, the best way to do that is either via a mix mod or on one of the tiles. Because we're clean out of uh, FPGA IOs on the carrier. Loads of cores with audio support from FPGA. Yeah, I mean, it could be, you know, in your retro, one of your retro tiles. You could put the support in for that because you've got the FPGA IOs. Or, as I say, you can do it on the mix mod. Don't forget, you've got the mix mod on the back. That it doesn't have to be a mix mod. What I was thinking of doing, how about this for an idea? Okay, it could be on the top. One of the things I was thinking of doing, Laurie, this may be of interest to you. So, the mix mod here. Hold on, can you see my cursor? I wasn't going to actually um, necessarily uh, solder that in. I mean, I could provide it and you solder it in yourself. Reason being is you might not want to use that as a normal mix mod. What you could do is do a little board that sits on here and then have, instead of having your right angle connectors in the mix mod, you have a vertical connector and then a little board of these dimensions could sit on there at the same height as the tiles. That could then have any connectors you want on it. Just a possibility. So I might offer that as an option because I could think of a few uses like that where I wouldn't necessarily want a big mix mod sticking out the back but a small daughter board to use those FPGA pins you know to, I could put all sorts on there that'd be useful including a screen right you could use that to connect to your screen freeing up the tiles So the ULX free S when they sell it they don't don't include the connectors soldered in. You they just provide them and you um solder them if you so wish. Yeah, Laurie agrees for the screen. So yeah, the mix mod connector, you could do a very small board, really easy to do, and then you could put an FPC connector on there for the uh L C D and you've got up to sixteen lines. 
you could do a screen and you could do your audio on there. You could even put a codec on there if you wanted. If you're really fussy about your audio. Not only that, it could actually connect to the jumpers as well. You could put can on there. <laughs> Glad you want to do that. But you've got I squared C. Or can, which might be useful. So that would leave the options open. So I was kind of thinking that way anyhow. Then people can do what they like. And then else you can think of before we move on. And I've got my PowerShell up. I'm gonna run GTK Wave as well. I need that. Oh, wait a minute. Ah. Right, let me get um, this stuff up. Hold on. So um, we're looking at the stepper stuff last time. Sorry, just rearranging my screen here. Uh, if you remember last time, what we were doing, we'd um, on the, hmm, I'm not sure I'm looking at the right file here, the right trace. On the stepper, um, this isn't the right file, damn it. We went back and to the end margin stepper and we added in support for, let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back. We added support for the direction and step control back into the MIGEN source. We did it on the iStudio thing and then we put those changes back into the MIGEN stuff. And if you remember where I left off the last stream, um, I did it. But it wasn't really working 
the way I followed. Well, I pretty soon afterwards I saw what the problem was. The very next day when I opened it, it's fairly obvious. Um, but I need to show you the trace, so bear with me. I'm not sure that this is the right trace. Hold on. Let me just do a reload. Okay. Let me get rid of this. I'm looking at the wrong part. Let me start from the very beginning. Ah, damn it! I just realised what I've done. I've just deleted the original trace and rebuilt it on the command line. <sighs> okay, bear with me a sec. I will just go back and reintroduce the error I had before. Oh, you won't be able to see what the problem was. Typical. I will show you the stupid error that I made that prevented it from operating. Reload. Reform. Right, so clock. Direction, direction synchronized, uh, hmm. step, step synchronized, then we've got our sequence and our phase. I won't bother with um, reset because we're not actually using that. So let me just check that this was wrong. Sorry, I'm clicking. Now we get back to the start. There we go. So if we look at the waveforms here, I think one of the things I was look so just to remind you, so we have the clock, obviously, tick tock, the direction. Then we have the synchronized direction. I'll come back to that step signal. And then the synchronized step. Sequence is internal to the stepper module or class. Uh, so it's going through its sequences and the phase. And we can break the phase out so we can see the individual uh, patterns. And I was a bit suspicious about these patterns. Do you remember? We weren't looking quite right. Um, when I looked more carefully at the step sequences and the direction sequences, these also didn't look right because all you see that's going on is it changing for here. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Well, I was expecting that to at least go to 1, 1 or something at some point i.e. shifting through the patterns because it's actually uh we're shifting in through two d types in order to resynchronize to the clock these signals but it's not going through uh, and i was wondering why the stepper motor wasn't turning on the output i could feel some vibration in there and also if you look at the pattern for the phases they're not looking straight there's something amiss um so if I then return towards the code, uh, in particular, the line where we step through, can you see this here, where we're doing the shift in? So on each clock post, what we're doing is we're taking uh, the step signal, 
we're resampling the step coming in and we're add, shifting that into the two bit synchronized step register. And that's what this is doing. But the mistake that I made here was this should be the existing step register. And it wasn't. I'm just pasting in the regular step signal. And that's why we're not seeing the combinations. Same with the direction. And that was the error that I found. Yeah. Uh, so when I um, I save that, let's rebuild that, re um, synthesize, uh, simulate, and reload, reload waveform. Then we see something more sensible. Can you now see what's happening here with direction 000111 and then on step same sort of thing the synchronized version of step 11100 let's go back to the first one then so 00011100 so it's going through all the phases not only that but the clocks at uh, the phases look a bit more sensible And then when we run it, it does actually work. So let me just show you that operating. Oh dear. Uh, oh, that putty on there. Putty. Video capture device let me just try and get the um, capturing device operational damn lamp I'm gonna to need to move it because it's not not doing what it ought and here we see it is now stepping as it ought and changing direction look automatically marvelous so I fixed the bug silly typos easy to do though So that was the puppy that was causing us problems. Now I'm going to try and remember what we were doing next. I just noticed. I'm getting crushed to the corner here a little bit. <clears throat> My editor is nudging me. Um, so, one of the things that we need to think about doing next was <clears throat> um, controlling it directly from the ESP32. Yes. Laurie, I was planning to control it from the ESP32. 
so at the moment let me have a look so what i'm doing here is uh so in the simulation which is what we're running now we're automating the generation of the step and dir signals based on a counter very simple but what we ought to be doing is thinking about how we do that on the bench so on the bench here uh, i think we've already got it right on here so what this would do is use internal signals to generate that but what we need to do is externalize these two signals. So we would need two more pins to control that. Um, ones that are already connected to the uh, alloy. Sorry, not the alloy. Ones that are connected between the um, ice 40 up 5k and the um esp 32 s2 uh so i just need to remind myself what those signals were hold on Uh, let's open CAD for uh, it's icicle, isn't it? Now, where did I keep this? Was it under alloy? Oh my goodness, I haven't opened this in a couple of weeks. No. Uh, okay. Um, excuse me for a sec whilst I locate the original design. I've got two ultra files here. Here we go. Ice I think is the one. So let me just remind you guys what we're looking at here. I know I keep forgetting, switching between all these different designs. Ta da! I know it says hybrid fusion on the top, but it was actually icicle. I should probably correct that. So here we see a bunch of lines IO between the uh, ESP32 and the ICE40. This is the SPI plus a few other sides. If I remind myself about the circuit. Yeah, I can bring that up. I think uh, schematic. So here's the uh, ESP32 and the ICE40. If you look at the yellow lines here, some of those are part of the uh, SPI connectivity, others are quad SPI parts. 
the red ones between the two um, so if I look at the schematic there's some particular ones I want to pick out that I know are connected because they're not all connected because this is a slightly different version but um, let me just turn that right turn the schematic on okay let me bring that forward and in particular what we want to look at here uh, if I remember, what am I using? I'm using the spy lines, which are BSB B clock BIO zero BIO one. So I'm using those for. In addition, if I remember rightly, I've also got uh, X clock for the clock. And I think I had, what were the other ones that I've tested that I've used? Might be three, two and three. Hold on. Just see that on the CAD. Uh, two and three. Sorry, may have just been a dropout, guys. Uh, I can't see which signals these are. Hold on. I'm just um, hovering between these two. Uh, oh, why is that not highlighting? Show BIO3. I see two. Sorry, Laurie, I don't know why it's doing that. The frame rate looks good at the moment. Um, BIO2 and why can't I see BIO3? That's worrying. Oh, I can, it's right next to it. Are these two connected? What are these other ones here? I've got five. Six. Seven, five, six, or seven, any of those would probably do. So, what are they connected to on this side? GPIO 40, 41, 42. Um, sorry, let me just switch back. This is I'm looking at what's connected here so I can see like seven, six, five, any of those lines could probably be used. They in turn connect into um, GPIO 40 through 41, 40, 41, 42, etc. Um, so if I return to here, yeah, let's just have a look at oh, sorry, you lost the chat history. Um, sorry, I don't know what went on there. I, I know there was a um disconnect and a reconnect because I got notified from OBS but right so what I wanted to look at what do I have I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this in time 
if I look at the alloy connections that I've got, what have I got designed in here? I've got my spy pins. Um, so I can use the same pins I'm using for spy temporarily, couldn't I? Like SCK or Mozzie, something like that, or CS and Mozzie. Let me just open the um, <coughs> Python. And it's not seeing oh no. We reconnect to the uh, Python um, circuit Python drive. Yeah. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me just reopen that file dialog. It didn't see the um, D drive. Oh, here we go. D drive E code. So what we're doing here is we're passing in uh, yeah I did I think you've had another network problem that's strange Laurie I'm not getting anything this end at the moment it's all hunky-dory I'm getting good transfer rates and no I don't think I'm getting any interruptions let me just double check 2148. I haven't had a disconnect for about six minutes. Um, right, what was I using? Board NS SGA. Oh, my pins are somewhat mixed up here. Why am I using those pins? Because I'm using a different circuit Python pin layout. Uh, it makes it complicated. So if I was to go and it were true. I'd need to a PGA program. FPGA start. Oh, I think I might need to change the FPGA library. Hold on. Because if I wanted to reuse these pins, I 
So what are the other pins I'm talking about? Passing in a reset pin, a clock and a CS, right? So I could use the CS, I can't use a clock. So I could use CS to do stepping, maybe. Keep the DIR. What what I'm worried about is because I've got I could de in it actually. Mm -hmm. So I could then use that mozzie. What I'm thinking here. is I do something like rather than start oh no I need oh damn it no I do I need it to I need FPGA start to run because it's going to keep the clock running I was thinking of doing de-initing the FPGA to release the pins for other usage. I could probably use this pin to do the stepping because it won't be using that. So I was thinking here I could, you know, invert that. Um, sorry, just put my, um, it's, CS value, false, true, false, true, false, true. I wonder if I can um, but the whole point of this is to use better control mechanism sorry look Laurie's asking um, do you really want to use a step pin from the ESP32 rather than sending the speed wouldn't it be best just to use SPI well the answer to that is yes it would be better to just use SPI um, you know, one of the entire purposes of this is taking the time consuming IO type stuff away from the microcontroller so it doesn't have to worry about it. Um, basically, because the ESP32 in this case is doing the motion control, it should only be concerned with the motion control, it shouldn't be concerned with the individual stepping signal or direction. Um, so yeah, SPI is where we're going with this, eventually. I mean, we could just start working on that, miss out the uh, stepping thing. Let's just talk about that briefly. I don't know, I, I'm not going to have time to do it all. That's the only trouble, because we've already been streaming two hours. We've only got probably five or ten minutes. I mean, we'll probably cover it next time. But let's just go over what, what we need to do with it, because it's, it's quite important. So... 
One of the problems is when you're doing stepping from a microcontroller, it tends to be very timely. It consumes a lot of time. If you do the analysis on your motion control software, if you're controlling a bunch of different stepper motors, different axes from the microcontroller, you've normally got somewhere in your firmware um, something like an interrupt or something that is regularly called that updates the stepper lines and direction lines and that is being really rapidly called when you do an analysis on your firmware code you find it spends most of its time in those well normally an interrupt um, doing around robbing on the step lines because it has to do it has to generate a defined pulse of specific width on all of the stepper lines and then it's called back at different times depending on the motion control speed it's quite complex but there's a round robin thing but it ends up spending a lot of its time doing it and it's really wasteful um, I mean you don't have a choice if you just do implement it in one microcontroller so one of the things one of the advantages of offloading that to the um, FPGA is it will have no problem doing that. You know, you don't need interrupts in the FPGA to do something timely like that. So the thinking was that you pass in certain information. So the ESP32, the orchestration layer, the, the firmware level, level, if you like, not the real time level, what it does is it, it makes the plan of steps you do that in any motion control software that pre-plans it knows how much it's got to move and it's it knows the speed at which it would move so what you could do is you could just have a transfer an SPI transfer to the FPGA that said something like uh, move this many steps in the simplest form that would just be an 8-bit transfer you know a byte so you could actually move 127 steps why 127 because the direction you need to split that 256 255 into two halves so you've got a plus i move one way or a minus move the other way that stepper so you could move tell it to move up to uh 126 steps let's say in either direction depending where it was assigned or you know depending on the sign bit as to which way it was going so you then have a very simple mechanism so rather than you have the, the microcontroller hanging about for ages generating 128 separate pulses with the correct interval for each access all you need to do is just send you know one signal 128 and it knows to move at 128 so in terms of very simple schemes that is what you can do and if you had to move a larger distance than 128 for example well you could send it several 128s plus any remainder where it wasn't div divisible by 128 to get any number of steps achievable on any access and you have a register you know a movement a number of steps move to move register for each access it's very simple um so that ru rudimentary transfer is probably what we would want to look at achieving first but when you look into it a bit further you have to deal with um not just moving a number of steps but you have to look at the speed at which it moves in those steps it's very important so if you can imagine a 3D printer, for example, uh, when you're moving in a straight line, you can go pretty fast. When you're going around corners, it's a bit more difficult. And if you say 3D printing, you can't move too fast because you're trying to extrude, extrude plastic as well. So there's an upper limit to how fast uh, you can move. Otherwise, it doesn't leave a thick enough layer.
right? So there's all sorts of uh, things that you have to take into account. There are <clears throat> constraints, if you like, to the motion control system that the moves are planned within, i.e. top speeds, turning corner speeds, things like jerk and that. So how quickly it can change direction. Because one of the things that you can't do is you can't go from instantly from zero, you know, meters per second to tens of meters per second because you have to speed things up. It's mechanical. It takes time. There's inertia involved, mass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so normally, what you have is what's known as a trapezoidal control. Let me um, just bring up something. I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, let's get this up. Let's see if I can do a live, um, draw you some. Draw you some stuff. A picture paints a thousand words. So, um, Oh no, I didn't want another page, bear with me. Still an amateur with this device. Yeah, let's delete that page. Um, let's do another notebook. Let me just share this one and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let's go in landscape and let's do turn on sharing. Okay, hopefully, you guys can see that. So if you were to look basically at a low level, you've got a bunch of steps. And at a constant speed, the distance between these steps is constant. OK, what's that doing right over there? Not drawing in the center of the page. Bloody weird. Uh, so that, 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 you know, the distance between here and here is constant. That means you're moving at a constant speed. Now, if you are speeding up, it would go something like, I'm going to exaggerate this now. I know my square waves aren't brilliant. Basically, the distance between the step edges gets shorter as you go that way. So if you were to prof profile this, what you'd find is normally a movement would be something like this, no movement. Then you'd have an acceleration to the top speed and you'd have it steady at that top speed till it reached its destination then maybe slow down okay and then maybe change direction after okay so you can use a trapezoidal pattern to break this into sections so you have the first section here constant speed low then you have an acceleration period up here then you have another constant speed at high then a deceleration and then back to a constant low speed so you've effectively got one two three 
for five sections. So your movements get broken up into these trapezoidal parts. Now you need a way to express that and pass that information to the FPGA. So one scheme, I mean, you'd pre-plan, these would all be pre-planned into these trapezoidal parts. Uh, this would be in local memory in the ESP32, these parts. You then need to represent them in the transfer over SPI. So you could use, for example, three bytes, you know, byte one might be starting speed. Byte two, maybe number of steps. Three, end speed. Now that may look good from a from the ESP32 point of view, but from the FPGA point of view, that's not very good because it doesn't really know what speed is. So a better way might be, hold on. One. I'm just thinking you could send, hold on, number of steps to move to, that includes direction, the um, increment in time. or decrement ah, sorry this is terrible writing it's because I'm trying to do it holding it up in the air and it's really not a good idea so let me put it on this lap try again So ink or deck period where period here is the change in distance between the steps. So inside the FPGA, the way it's timing each edge of the steps that it internally generates would have a counter that's either decrementing if the speed was increasing. So the time between the steps is getting shorter or the counter would be incrementing, i.e. the distance between the steps would be increasing, i.e. it would be decelerating. So the number of steps and whether it was incrementing I accelerate, sorry, incrementing, in this case, that means deceleration or decrementing, which would mean acceleration. And if this was equal to zero, that would mean it's constant speed. So this scheme would work. So there's two, this would be two 8-bit um, values. There would be effectively transferring two bytes. One is the number of steps we're moving, either backwards or forwards, 0 to 126 or 0 to minus 127. 
and the same in terms of 0 to 126 or 0 to 127 increments in the design between each step, i.e. acceleration or deceleration. And if that was zero, obviously that'd be a constant speed. So that would be um, quite an effective way of doing it because that doesn't leave the FPGA having to do much. It just concentrates on doing the really fast real time stuff. The only issue you might have with that is if you were to do an analysis of the movement of your system, and it really depends what your motion controller is controlling. You know, if you go and look at your timing, if you did a analysis of what this looked like for all of the moves, you could do an analysis and say, well, is it spending a lot of time doing the constant speed stuff and very little time doing the acceleration and deceleration? If that's the case, maybe our way of describing the movement in our two pieces, two bytes, with the emphasis on incrementing and decrementing, if that is going to be zero a lot of the time, this may be a slightly inefficient way of conveying that information. And there's a couple of ways we could deal with that. The we could either find a better mechanism, which I don't have time to think about right now. Um, maybe you can go off and think about this as kind of homework. But there is a cheap way of doing this where you can actually just do a compression on the transfers. Because what's happening anyhow is these aren't being acted on immediately. These are going into a FIFO inside the FPGA. There's an asynchronous none real-time transfer going on between the ESP32 and the uh, FPA. So basically you are queuing up a stack of moves that are sitting into a, being moved into a FIFO over a QSPI or whatever, into a FIFO inside the FPGA. And the FPGA is pulling that off in a timely fashion, each of those trapezoidal sections and doing what it's being told to. So these bytes are being stored inside the FPGA. Uh, one way that you could do is you could have a compressor in between. Uh, and what the compressor of the information will do in this case is realize there's a lot of zeros in there. Uh, and you it would find a better way of expressing that. You can use, a, is it run length encoding or something like that? Gets rid of this kind of excessive zeros. Laurie, can you remember? Have you done much of this sort of stuff before? Um, so you could use a compression scheme. So if you couldn't think of a better way of organizing the information so that it was naturally efficient, given the characteristics of your movement, um, you could just use a compression, simple compression scheme. And it has to be simple because it has to be implemented inside the FPGA um, to actually reduce the amount of um, quad SPI traffic. And transfer that's going on yeah run length is one one option that's right no. so there are other things you can do to minimize the amount of data that's being transferred between ESP32 and the um, uh, FPGA the thing that works against you is, is more processing on ESP32 if that's running in an asynchronous fashion not real-time fashion that might not be a problem the problem might be on the fpga end where you have to implement a decompression scheme that might take quite a few resources to do that so finding a good way of encoding the information might be a better way to go anyhow it's something to think about it's a shame we can't implement it because we've run out of time but next time we will we'll add the spi in and we'll, we'll, we'll use, maybe we'll try this simple method. I mean, the first thing we should do is basically just do some steps, right? So forget about acceleration, deceleration, just tell it to do some steps backwards and forwards, get that working first. And then after that, we'll look at doing the, some of the trapezoidal stuff if we've got time. Um, so any questions before I go? Because I think uh, my time is just about done. Um, 
everyone get what I'm talking about in terms of separation of concerns? You know, the ESP32 is doing the motion planning. It's coming up with a whole bunch of moves that it's storing locally. It's then serializing those moves in some way. Our suggestion here is a two byte code consisting of a number of steps to move and an acceleration, deacceleration parameter. Um, which the FPGA then stores in local FIFO and then executes them in real time in order to get smooth motion the other end. Uh, so the FPGA bit here is really quite simple. Uh, most of the clever stuff is being done by the firmware in the SP32, but it's not being done in real time, it's being pre pre-calculated, pre-planned. And that's the way most of these motion control systems work. Maybe slightly different in robotics compared to something like a 3D printer because you have the time to do the planning. Um, the, cons the constraints of it executing are much longer than the actual pre-compiling of the planning. Um, because it's physical movement the other end, it's quite slow. Oh, Laurie lost me again. Okay. Well, sorry, guys, if you're losing me. Uh, you can revisit the stream. The recorded one will be better, and I'll get that uploaded on YouTube. So I'm going to call it a night, because uh, it is night here. And uh, next time, we will look at doing the movement steps over SPI. And if we've got time, we'll start putting in some trapezoidal control, acceleration and deceleration. Um, also, don't forget to join me down on the forum or Laurie or any of the other folks involved here. Whether you're discussing this, the new Black Eyes 5, uh, the boards that I'm going to make, or any of the micro Python stuff that's related to that. Okay, well, listen, guys, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you on the next stream, which again, hopefully should be next Wednesday. Ciao.